Okay, so today we're near Stafford in Staffordshire and we're at a place called Shubborough Hall. Uh, the main house that's currently here was built um, and enlarged pretty much throughout the 1700s, started just before the start of the 1700s. Um, I think pretty much finished off just after the end of the 1700s. So we're just on the main approach to the estate now. And this place is um, pretty much a complete working estate still. It's still got its um, sort of farm buildings and all that type of stuff. So it should be an interesting day. And I think just to the left of this cattle grid here, there's um, one of the features of the park. You probably can't see it on the camera because it's out of view to the left but it's um, sort of one of them Karajic monument things that um, copy something in Greece so I'll have a walk back to there at some point and we'll have a look at that but there's plenty to see here in the parkland and gardens and um, they might let us film in the house you never know so we'll see Uh, we're pretty early. The, uh, we're here at 20 to 9. The parkland opens at 9 in the morning and the house opens at about 11, I believe. So we'll just get parked up. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at today is called the Lantern of Demosthenes. I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, and this was built in around 1770 by James Athenian Stewart, who uh, did some other work on the estate. And this is a copy of the uh, Karajic monument in Athens. And you might have seen my video from the other week from the gardens at Alton Towers. And uh, they also had um, a copy of that uh, Karajic monument in Athens. And this is one that was built um, for Shugborough. But the one at Alton Terror has actually had um, like a square uh, base or plinth at the bottom. But this one doesn't have that. There's actually a doorway here. And you can just step inside. Not that you can see a lot, but... See some light poking through the top there. And uh, apparently, this has lost um, a few features since it was first built in the 1770s. And one of them was a bowl uh, created by Wedgwood. Well, that's long since gone, apparently. And um, Matthew Bolton was also. Um, Supposed to have done some kind of work for it, but um, that didn't really work out too well, apparently. So yeah, that's the uh, Lantern of Demosthenes, if that's how it's correctly pronounced. And there's the parkland beyond. Now this thing here, on the top of a hill that we've just uh, trekked up from the uh, lantern down there, it's called the Triumphal Arch, and you're probably seeing it in silhouette here, with the uh, sky behind. 
this is quite a view um, from any angle but especially from down sort of halfway down the hill which I'll uh, have a look at in a bit now it was the Anson family who created Shugborough Hall and uh, the park as you see it today and um, this triumphal arch um, commemorates Lord and Lady Anson And this was built during the 1760s. Through the arch from the top of the hill you can see the estate come into view. You can't really see the house from here because it's um, obscured by trees but you can just about see some farm buildings towards the right hand side. It's quite interesting up here because you can see some sort of graffiti scratched into the rocks from 1904, 1905. I think we've got an 1856 here. Then all sorts on this uh, inside bit here. And up towards the top from the other side. You might just be able to see that there's a, there's a bust of Lord Anson and his wife up there. And in between them, that's a Marshall Trophy. So yeah, that's the Triumphal Arch. And that's got to be about 30 or 40 feet high, something like that. That's it, you know, that's a big structure that is. And if you come halfway down the hill, you can just see the impact it has on the landscape as it overlooks the estate. I almost forgot to say that the uh, Triumphal Arch is actually a copy of the Arch of Hadrian in Athens so you can probably already see that there's um, a bit of a theme going on with some Greek stuff Helpfully on uh, these fences here they've provided some uh, information, uh, bits and pieces so there's something about funding for works on the Triumphal Arch there about conservation and a bit further down this is talking about a pagoda that used to be in the grounds but um, apparently it was washed away at some point so that's no longer there so we won't be uh, seeing that today but like you see here in 1795 there was a great flood that damaged a lot of the parkland so there we go here's a little map to give you an idea of uh, sort of the scale of the park and everything So, plenty to see. We're going to have a quick look in the walled garden, but before we do this I want to show you a reference picture here. So if you see that down there, that's the old gardener's house and the, uh, the glass houses where they used to grow, you know, plants, fruit, veg or whatever. And then we'll have a look in the uh, walled garden there. Okay, so if you have a look to the left now, you can see the uh, the gardener's house in the middle, the head gardener's house. Well, you'll notice that all the glass houses have gone now. On the front of the gardener's house, you can actually see the outline of where uh, a glass house would have sort of come out from the front of it. So, yeah, do you see that? And there's even still some sort of iron workings sticking out as well. Have a look at the automatic mower they've got on the go here. You can see it next to the fence just trundling around. Oh, I think I want to change direction.
and this walled garden was completed in around 1806 by Samuel Wyatt and he'd also completed one at um, Holcomb Hall in uh, the same period and this is what remains of a pool in the middle you can see the, uh, the gardener's house beyond there Just approaching the uh, park farmyard now. I think there's uh, toilets and a cafe and stuff in here now. You know, it's quite a substantial uh, farm they had going on here. Inside the farmyard buildings there's actually a, like a farm exhibition inside. Samuel Wyatt, by the way, he did a lot of work on the estate. Water wheels down there. Stones. Not far from the farmyard, we have this structure in the grounds which is called the Tower of the Winds. This was built in 1765 by James Stewart. And originally, uh, this used to actually stand on its own island that you had to reach by, um, I think there was a couple of ornamental bridges. And uh, sticking to the theme, this was also um, a copy of a building that was originally in Athens. And it looks like it's actually open, so let's have a little look inside. Wow, that's quite good. Look at the stained glass. I think these might move a little bit. Yeah, so the sort of outer windows and then those. Um, sort of screens inside with stained glass. And then is this marble or not? Not sure if that's marble or not. It's quite a nice room. Through this window, the house is over in that direction. In the distance, behind a few trees. So 
So yeah, it's a nice little space. Apparently there was a working dairy in the uh, basement area and uh, they're looking to restore that in the future. So that was the Tower of the Winds. And now it's time to follow this path and uh, we're going to go and see the house. A bit overcast today so uh, hopefully it won't rain too much but we're in the middle of uh, two or three weeks of really bad weather in the summer uh, well really wet weather I should say so hopefully it'll be all right hello and he's lost part of his horn and now Shugborough Hall finally starts to come into view So this is Shugborough Hall and uh, you'll see as we get closer that it's built in a neoclassical style. And this new mansion was created from around uh, 1693 by William Anson in place of an old house that he had demolished. In around 1748 his great grandson Thomas Anson had the house remodelled and extended by Thomas Wright. Um, including some end pavilions linked by a passage or passages on each side. At the start of the 1800s it was further altered and extended by the architect Samuel Wyatt including the uh, Tenarnic pillars and these pillars um, they actually resemble carved stone but they're actually hollow timber apparently so we'll check that out yeah, so if we get a bit closer to one of these pillars, let's have a look. So you can hear. Actually, not stone at all. Some nice boot scrapers in. This is the entrance hall. Nice bronze Amazing scene.
These paintings are actually uh, stuck to the wall, so they're not actually able to be removed. That's one of the Lord Anson's. Uh, This is the red drawing room. So these are pieces from the Lantern of Demosthenes that we saw earlier at the start. That's how the Tower of the Winds used to look on its little island. You can see that. This is the library. I think I'm going to see if we can get into the uh, servants' quarters now. This is the servants' quarters now, as you can see. A lot more modest. Family silver, or someone's family silver.
Hello, you all right? Yeah. So this is the laundry room, is it? This is yeah. the dry laundry. This is an ironing stove for keeping irons warm. This is the wet laundry room, apparently, where washing and stuff was done. The mangle over it. This is uh, towards the kitchen. Somewhere to hang game. And then this is the main kitchen by the looks of it. Or oh, food preparation area. Quite a large stove. Filter. Mm. That building in front of us by the clock, apparently that was the stable block. Quite grand. Okay, so that was inside the house. Let's uh, have a little look around the back now. Nice little urn here. Some kind of water trough down here. It's got a date of 1769 on the front. It's got some kind of classical designs on it. And then these uh, strange looking things, these look kind of eastern, you know, inspired. Apparently these more formal gardens, these uh, sort of terraced bit, were possibly laid out by W.A. Nesfield, the uh, garden designer. I'm going to come down to this nice sculpture that uh, someone's decorated with sunglasses for the day by the looks of it. That leads down to the river. Looks like there's some people uh, kayaking and camping or something at the moment. Which is strange, but there we go. And there's these sort of urns. Next to the steps leading down to the river. Where these people have probably uh, launched from in their kayaks today. And this thing here next to the river as well. This is called the Ruin 
and this has been here since around 1750 and originally um, there would have been even more to this as well but uh, bits of it have been lost over time if you look up to the uh, towards the top there on the left that's actually a druid and apparently that's made out of code stone which we've come across before which is uh, a sort of artificial stone that's easier to mould into shapes and uh, whatnot. So I'll uh, zoom in a little bit. There. there you go. Code stone druid. And apparently around the 1960s this was actually found to be sort of leaning into the river so it had to be um, stabilised and they have to monitor it, monitor it to this day to uh, make sure it's not leaning over again and possibly falling into the river and uh, these kinds of things um, these kinds of ruins were just added to uh, country house gardens to give it a sort of more picturesque look and uh, evoke older times sort of thing Looks like it's about to start raining, so I'll probably have a bit of dinner about now. But here you can see the rear of the house again. Thank God for James Athenian Stuart, who completed this Doric temple by around 1760, because he's uh, just sheltered me from that rain shower. By the 1960s, the bottom of these pillars had actually deteriorated so um, they were reconstructed using Hollington stone and if you look you can uh, you can see the slight difference in colour and you can see the joins there and again this was uh, modelled on, on an old uh, structure in Athens so the old Greek theme uh, continues you can see a decorated ceiling and actually uh, I think this was vandalised in the past and the lead was um, taken from the roof and I think if you look carefully the ceiling looks to be bowing a little bit down towards the middle so they might want to keep an eye on that there's a few uh, mo motifs and things so yeah, that's the uh, Doric Temple of Six Pillars. Moving away from the Greek theme, <coughs> we come across the next feature, which you can see there, which is the Chinese house. That was completed around 1747, but we don't actually know exactly who was responsible for this. You can see there's a, a bridge next to it. That looks pretty sweet. And this apparently used to be full of Chinese artefacts that Admiral Anson had brought back from his voyages, but um, they were like to move to the house for safekeeping. Looks like there's some work going on on it at the moment. A few workmen around, etc. Very nice. Obviously, looks like I am.
This next feature is called the Cats Monument. This was completed by around 1749 and built by Charles Trubshaw. As you can see, there's a cat on the top. There's two theories why this exists. And the first one is that it commemorates a cat that travelled around the world with um, Admiral Anson. And the other one is that it's a memorial to the last of a breed of Persian cats which were uh, kept for many years by Thomas Anson. Thomas Anson also kept a herd of Corsican goats, which is why you can see some uh, goats around the base of the monument there, like on this corner. Not far from the Cats Monument, there's uh, what appears to be a disused tennis court. Then having crossed back over the river, come to the next feature, which is the Shepherd's Monument. This was completed in the 1750s and was built by Thomas Wright. In the middle there's a marble carving by Peter Schumacher's, based on a painting by Poussin. Interestingly, there's also this inscription on the bottom, which some people think is a code to be broken, but apparently no one's um, been able to work out what this uh, inscription or code means to this day. Walking along the riverbank um, behind the house, come past uh, another little thing of a bit of interest, which is this blue bridge. You can see it's um, it's got a lot of uh, similarities to the one next to the Chinese house. It looks to be iron in construction as well. I think these are even the same sort of designs on these uh, piers here. Let's have a walk over here. You can see how far we've had to come from the house. You can probably see the uh, the house right in the middle distance. And then not far from that blue bridge, not far at all, there's this old boathouse, which has uh, seen better days I think. And as you can see, uh, could have come out of the boathouse onto the uh, river there. And there's the door where you could have gone into the boathouse. Now I'm going to trek right across to the other side of the park, way past the house again and some of the features I've showed you, but I just wanted to show you that bridge and the boathouse. The sun's decided to come out now, finally. Um, I'm going to show you another feature, just outside the park, in a, in a second, after we've gone past this uh, pretty little sort of lodge building, 
that's just on the edge of the estate. This is dated 1859 on the uh, front. So this is called the Essex Bridge and this is Grade 1 listed. And this is actually the longest remaining pack horse bridge in England. And I think this was built in the 1600s. Definitely worth seeing. We'll have a little walk over the top in a second. So this is the bridge and you'll see it's got these strange uh, sort of triangular, triangular cutouts at the side. I'm not 100% sure what they're for but I might have read once that they were sort of when people or sort of horses were travelling down the middle it was easy to move out the way for them but I'm probably totally wrong there so feel free to uh, let me know. So that was Shugborough Hall in Staffordshire and uh, it was well worth a day out there. Um, plenty of historical stuff to see and uh, lots of features and worth having a look around the house and that. So. Thanks a lot for watching again, I really appreciate it and uh, I'll see you next time.